Joining us on the line here is Lee Purchase. Lee Purchase has a interesting uh, podcast that we're going to find out a little bit more about. Uh, Lee, it's great to have you on my show. Thanks, and uh, thank you for having me. Great to be here. Give me a little bit of your background so our listeners can get an idea of what you're all about and uh, what you're doing right now. Well, um, I have a very varied background. I've tried acting. I've tried writing. Um, I've tried beekeeping. Um, you name it. I've been a sign maker. Uh, but I've always had this interest in investigations, criminal investigations. Um, so a buddy and I, we came up with this idea of uh, starting a podcast focusing solely on one unsolved homicide, um, and we would devote an entire season to researching that unsolved homicide and uh, trying to just, you know, more than anything, reinvigorate the case um, and, if at all possible, try to uncover some secrets. Well, tell me a little bit about the case of uh, Mr. Richard Aderson. It, it sounds like this has been a, around for a long time. Why, why did this case grab your attention? Why, why did you decide to focus on this one in particular? Um, well, I had actually started with another case. Um, and when I spoke with the detective on that case, he had asked me not to pursue it um, through a podcast. Uh, so then I, you know, I, I agreed because I'm, I, I'm always looking for as much assistance from the police departments in, in terms of giving me uh, information that they've already released. And that detective was very much against doing the podcast on that case. So then I just really, uh, there were a couple of, um, of principles. Um, one, that the case had to be over 20 years old. Um, and this case is 21 years old. And it would have to be within driving distance of where I live. Mm. Uh, this is probably about an hour away from where I live. Um, and then, added to that, this case received a lot of uh, attention in 1997. It was a road rage incident, and it was featured on both America's Most Wanted and also on South Mystery. So in terms of just the amount of information out there on the Internet, um, it, it provided a great start to, uh, to begin the research. So is it basically confirmed that, um, like you said, it was a road raid in incident where, where uh, Richard uh, Aderson was, was shot in the chest and later passed away in the hospital? Has it been established that it was uh, the person he had, uh, had uh, the road rage incident with? Or are, is there some speculation that it was possibly unrelated to that and, and might be somebody else? I think... Um, the way the investigation has progressed um, up until now is that it was a road rage incident. Um, there have been some twists and turns in this case, uh, but in 1997, there weren't a lot of cell phones. Mr. Addison actually did have a cell phone. So after this very minor collision, um, and it was more like a side swipe, uh, both of the motorists pulled over and presumably, you know, to blame one another. Um, apparently there were witnesses on Interstate 84 at the time who said that they saw two um, men arguing on the side of the road. Uh, that led to the, um, the assailant pulling out a gun and shooting Mr. Addison once in the chest. He then got back into his vehicle and left. Mr. Addison climbed back into his vehicle. There are some reports that he crawled back to his vehicle, um, and he made a 911 call. And in that 911 call, parts of which were released on Unsolved Mysteries, uh, there was no mention that he knew this gentleman. Um, he actually explained to the 911 operator that it had just been an accident. Um, and heartbreaking to hear, he actually says in his 911 call, I didn't deserve this. Um, he also described the, uh, the assailant as being a... Uh, middle-aged white male, anywhere from 40 to 50 years old, about six feet tall with a slim build, um, wearing glasses, and uh, with a short, cropped beard. So in addition to that, he also described his vehicle as a uh, late model green Jeep Cherokee, um, and that 
would be within the years of 1995 to 1997. Uh, and additionally, he did identify that the car had New Hampshire license plates. He didn't give a, a license plate number, but he identified the, uh, the vehicle as being from New, New Hampshire. Do you think the fact that this um, this murder took place back in 1997, it's harder to figure out versus, let's say, if this happened like, uh, I don't know, last year or the year before where there's where there, there's a mountain of scientific tools that people can figure out and use these days uh, versus it happening in 1997? I wonder if there's a difference uh, because of when it happened. Is, is that a factor at all? Oh, I, I believe it, it definitely is a factor. With the proliferation of, of cameras everywhere and then of easy pass systems, there, is, there are more tools out there for, for the police to track your movements. Um, 1997, there was no easy pass. Uh, like I said before, cell phones were just coming out, and, and they weren't the smartphones that we're used to today. Um, cameras weren't everywhere, um, and... And if there was uh, no contact between Mr. Richard Adderson and his assailant, other than that one gunshot, there's no DNA, there are no fingerprints, um, you know, then it becomes a lot more difficult to, uh, to solve this case. But I do think in, in the amount of research that I've done so far, I do believe that this case is solvable. Have you had any major clues over the years that uh, prompted uh, the authorities' attention? Um, and do those still pop up, or do they lead anywhere, anywhere closer to solving the case, or or further away from solving the case? No, I think I think that there are clues um, from the initial investigation um, that have have led the New York State Police detectives, the investigators. To, uh, to focus in on at least an area. And, and what I mean by that is uh, Mr. Adderson identified that his assailant was driving a green Jeep with New Hampshire plates. Now, um, at first glance, I was thinking, could this have been a mistake on the part of a dying man? Um, I did research into license plates at the time and the new hampshire license plate um at that time was white background with new hampshire on the top and the state motto underneath underneath the uh the license plate number saying you know live free or die um there were uh, massachusetts at the same time had a very similar license plate um white background green lettering obviously the not the uh not with the motto However, so, so you could dismiss this identification of a New Hampshire license plate as just, like I said, uh, a mistake on the part of a dying man. However, in September of 1997, so this is about seven months after the, uh, the murder occurred, a law firm from New Hampshire, Mass uh, Manchester, I'm sorry, Manchester, New Hampshire, reached out to the New York State Police and they made inquiries into this case on the, uh, representing an unidentified client. Um, the New York State Police then went back and forth into Manchester, um, attempting to get more information from the law firm. The law firm did cite attorney-client privilege. Um, but just the fact that this law firm in New Hampshire did make these inquiries, I think that that would, you know, suggest that Richard Adderson's uh, description of a, a New Hampshire plate was accurate. And then there was another twist. So this was in 1997, like I said, September 1997, when this law firm made inquiries. Uh, the New York State Police had gone up to Manchester several times after the incident. And in April of 1998, they actually released some other information to the public and they they released another piece of information that Richard Adderson had told the 911 operator that being that his assailant had, had identified himself as a police officer now whether or not that was accurate and it was could have been that assailant just 
uh, trying to scare Richard, intimidate him by being a police officer, he had identified himself as a police officer. So, um, you know, then the police at that point had to check into those leads. Um, so I do think that there are, uh, there was information back that they were able to uh, get from 1997 that still continues to be part of the investigation. Well, when you are looking at this case in particular, um, you know, when you're watching TV and especially the investigative crime shows that you see on TV, you'll hear of uh, these longtime investigators that may have been retired after 20, 30 years, but they're experts in their field. Uh, they like to tackle cases like this, the cold cases, and, and try to re-examine them and figure them out. Has that happened with this case? Have there been, have there been some possibly I don't know retired FBI folks or or somebody that's uh, that's an expert in their field uh, wanting to take a stab at this? Have have you run into that at all to reinvestigate I have, this? No, I. You know what? If if there have been uh, these organizations that are comprised of uh, ex detectives, FBI agents, if they've looked into this case, the New York State Police has has not told me. Um, so I'm unaware of whether or not any of these old um, detectives uh, have looked into this case. But I can tell you that during the course of my research, I have reached out to some forensic psychologists and some um, other people who have been in law enforcement to get their opinion on the case. And one of the things that I've, I've heard is that, you know, it is a difficult case. Um, because if it's a stranger on stranger um, crime, it becomes that more difficult. But I, like I said, I, I do believe that this case is solvable. I think that Richard Adderson was the best witness to this crime that they could have had. And he was on the phone. He was on the 911 call for approximately nine minutes. So in addition to whatever the emergency operator was telling him to hold on and you know, that, that the uh, emergency services were coming at the time. He was also providing clues, um, clues that hopefully will one day lead to the, uh, to the you know, capture and conviction of this, uh, this guy. Do you ever run into this, and, you know, this sometimes it's not the fault of necessarily uh, the police, but just the fact that, you know, you have a level of bureaucracy you do have to deal with and a level of red tape that you have to, you have to, uh, you have to deal with in, in trying to, you know, find uh, more information about this. Have you run into that yourself where you're dealing with a lot of red tape and bureaucracy in order to try to get through it, in order to, to figure this out? Or is that not the case? I, 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 I think in any case where you're asking a police department to look at an open investigation, there's always going to be pushback because, you know, there is no such thing as a cold case to police departments. If, if it's, especially if it's a homicide and that case has not been solved, then they are constantly, maybe not constantly, but they're, they continually look at these cases. Um, so there, you know, there are, there, there is red tape. Um, a police department is, is, is not always open to, um, divulging all the information in the case. Um, but I, I, you know, I do think that it's, at this point, I didn't meet with the, uh, the investigator from the New York State Police Department, uh, the investigator who is actively investigating this case. Um, and he's a young guy, seems very smart, and he has a new set of eyes. And I think that is what is very important to some of these older cases. Um, the investigators or the detectives who could have been investigating that case maybe just didn't see something that may be more obvious to a new set of eyes. And, um, you know, so it's a new regime. It's 21 years later. Um, inevitably, investigators and detectives retire. Um, and so now you have this uh, new investigator who, um, you know, hopefully we'll uh, see something that maybe was missed by the old regime. 
Lee Purchase is our guest here with his uh, latest podcast. I believe it's it's called Slim Turkey, correct? Yes? Yes, it's called Slim Turkey, and that's a uh, play on the uh, the old expression, Slim Pickens, uh-huh. for uh, for which cases we're, uh, we're looking at that the clues were, uh, there weren't a lot of clues. Well, before I let you go here, Lee, if you could uh, briefly uh, tell us a little bit uh, about how people can find your podcast and where they can check it out and uh, anything else you can you can tell us about uh, location-wise. Sure. Thank you. Um, well, the podcast is going to be released in August, uh, so we're a little less than a month away from releasing our first episode. Um, right now, if you just want to uh, get some updates, we, you can reach us on Twitter. And we are at Mr. Slim Turkey. So that's at Mr. Slim Turkey on Twitter or on Instagram. Our username is Mr. Period Slim Turkey. Um, I do want to say that if anyone um, has any information on this case, I would highly suggest them calling the New York State Police Department. Um, they are considering this an open investigation. Um, and uh, there, if, can I give you their number? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Why not? Great. It's 845-677-7300. Again, that's 845-677-7300. And their case number for this, for the Richard Adderson case is 302-1797. Or just use his name, Richard Adderson. Um, and then the last thing that I really want to say is that, um, is that, we are hoping, as I, um, as I stated before, we're hoping to just reinvigorate the case. Um, we want to reignite interest and, like I said, uncover maybe some hidden secrets. This case is 21 years old. Um, last year, on the 20th anniversary of the case, the Poughkeepsie Journal featured an article, and it was called 20 Years Later, I-84 killing remains unsolved, um, and this this article was inspired by Richard's son Dave, who who actually worked at the Journal of News at the time, and and suggested doing a a 20 year anniversary piece on his father's uh, on his father's homicide. Um, so, you know, I I think that the case will ultimately be solved by people who don't think that they know anything and just may have a little piece of the puzzle that if someone else gives their little piece of the puzzle, investigators can put it all together and hopefully solve this case. All right. We appreciate you swinging by, and thank you so much. And uh, best of luck to you here, Lee, um, with trying to get to the bottom of this case in your podcast. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the time.